you go into Course Tools Contents, you'll see a folder called Videos, or if you just go look on Content Quick Links on the side, you'll see Videos. Right now, there's only one, January 18, 2017. So there's a video there. It's kind of okay if you don't go back and review it, but if you want to do the in-class assignment that you may have missed last Wednesday, you would want to review that. Also, over there in the videos is a link that just says all J.G. Thompson videos. If you know that we made a video that day, but you don't see it listed in D12, just go and look here and look through the recent videos, and you should be able to find it. You can see that they're all named very consistently. CIT, followed by the number, followed by the dash, followed by our class number. So you can just do a search in Google, and it'll pop up all the, uh, all the videos that match that. So, starting with chapter one. I will not cover every single thing that's in the book. I will not cover every single thing that's in the PowerPoint. There will be times when I kind of gloss over it. Mostly that means it's because I'm not going to be putting an exam on it. That doesn't mean that it's not a good thing to read in your text. It just means that I'm not going to spend class time talking about it. But there won't be anything on an exam that I didn't cover in the PowerPoint in class. It just means that I may not hit every single topic in the PowerPoint. If you do that, then you wouldn't get very far into it before the end of the semester. <laughs> So, introductions to computers and programs. This is the kind of thing that we're going to skip through pretty quick. Why program? What is a computer? A programmable machine designed to follow instructions. All right, this is getting boring already. Program, instructions in computer memory to make it do something. A programmer, the person who writes instructions to make the program perform a task. So without programmers, no programs. Without programs, a computer does not do anything. Okay, so what is a computer really? It's a device that will follow a series of instructions. Back in the old, old, old days, computers could look like this. There we go. can't really see it, but you enter your numbers, your input in, by spinning these dials, and then you turn a crank, and it'll print the answer up in these digits up at the top. What kind of stuff are you doing there? Well, by uh, the 1800s, the need for math to keep track of, you know, profits made from, you know, your empires or, you know, calculating, uh, you know, engineering equations or performing astronomical calculations, you know. That, that kind of stuff was pretty much exceeding the ability of pen and paper to do quickly. So if I can get this to pop up, or maybe I'll just do it here. Say you had the equation 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. And we wanted to make a little table for all possible values of x. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're not going to do a whole bunch of them. But 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Well, if we feed 0 in as x, our result is just going to be, well, that's 0, that's 0 plus 1. So your answer would be 1. You put x here and then result here. Now, if it's 1, what's 3x squared? That's 1, that's 3, plus 2, that's 4, 5, plus 1 is 6. If it's 3, 3 times 3 squared, that's 27. This is going to get way too hard to, for my brain to handle very quickly. So 27 plus 6 is 33, 34. 4, 3 times 16, that's 48, plus another 8 is 56, 57, 3 times x squared, that's 3 times 25, that's 75, plus 10 is 85, 86, okay, 
So you saw that it took me a while to do that. As, as a person, who, you know, with pen and paper or whatever forms, you know, it took me a while to do that. What people would do is you'd go to the library or to, or to your mathematical school and there were bound volumes containing thousands upon a pack, thousands of equations written out in this form with all the answers. And then they'd show the equation and then they'd show the value of x and then they'd show you the answer. Or if it was something that had x and y, you know, but it would be pages upon pages upon pages because, you know, you might want to be able to do this for any number between 1 and 10,000. So some poor fool sat there, you know, and, and wrote all this out and, and put it into books, into tables. You know, logarithms are the same way. So this process can be automated. What is the difference? I hope that I got these numbers right, by the way. What's the difference between 1 and 6? The difference between that is 5. What's the difference between 6 and 34? I think that's 28. I think I made a mistake. What's the difference between 34 and 57? 23. I've definitely made a mistake. What's the difference between 57 and 86? I so botched this. Dadgummit. I'm going to take one more stab at it, and if it doesn't come out right, then we're just going to completely ignore this idea. This isn't going to be on an exam. I was trying to, to be clever and give you an example of how a calculation could be pro, uh, sped up. Instead, I'm going to make it this equation, just to simplify. x squared plus 10. That's a pretty easy. So for 1, 1 squared plus 10 is 11. For 2, 4 plus 10 is 14. For 3, 9 plus 10 is 19. For 4, 16 plus 10 is 26. And for 5, 25 plus 10 is 35. Okay, but there's a pattern. What's the difference between those two? 5. What's the difference between those two? Also 5. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to get very upset at myself again. 3, 5. What's the difference between these two? 7. 7. You can kind of guess what the next one's going to be. What's the difference between those two? Nine. Nine. Right. Then if you took the difference between these, the difference between that and that is two. The difference between that and that is two. The difference between that and that is two. So if we wanted to figure out the value of six, we could say that, oh, because nine plus two is 11, and then nine 11 more than 35 is 46. That may even be right. 6, 46, well, 6 squared is 36 plus 10 is 46. So we were able to calculate this just by setting up these numbers. So very quickly, you know, you, you could fill these almost in like playing Sudoku or whatever. If you had the numbers and you had this and you had the pattern set up, you could just set this table up and you could keep adding them up and you could get them. Once you express it like that, you see that, yeah, that could be automated. You could set wheels and then you turn the crank and it would give you this number. And you would turn the crank again and it would give you this number. It would turn the crank again and this would give you this number. That's what the first computers, this is Pascal's computer. It could only basically do equations in this form. And multiplication and addition and a subtraction. And yeah, they were not really very flexible. So, a guy named Babbage came up with something called the difference engine. And he got a huge grant from the uh, British government and from backers to invent it. And the idea was is to make it so that you could feed in a series of cards, just like our, uh... all right, Siri thought I said, hey, Siri, a car, and her response was, I'm not sure I understand. Please stop that. Okay, so if this was supposed to be a programmable device, by the 1800s, looms, you know, those things that, that weave, stop that, the things that weave um, were programmable by, uh, by cards. You'd stick a card in it, 
and then it would leave a complex pattern based on that card. What Babbage wanted to do is make a device where you could feed a deck of kind of cards as numbers and as the equation, and then it would run and perform those calculations and then print all the results. And he got really close, but he didn't quite get it finished, and then the backers came and they took the device apart to, to try to recoup their, uh, you know, their losses and stuff like that. But anyways, so there were computers in the 1800s. This one is far more representative of what we consider a computer, although it doesn't look like one, um, than, the, uh, than that, just that hand-cranked one. Because the hand cranked one really isn't very programmable. All you do is you set some dials and you turn the thing and you know and you get a number. That's not really doing much. But something like this was meant to be programmable, where you would give it cards, just like punch cards, and from the night from the year 1940s or whatever, and you, you would run it and it would print its results. And he got really close. People have made modern versions of this based on his designs, and they do actually work. This is where the idea of steampunk came from, by the way is a guy wrote a book, or two guys wrote a book, Steve Gibson and, uh, and another writer whose name escapes me. And the idea was, is what if computers really had been invented in the 1800s? And so, you know, there was a technological explosion, but everything was steam powered. And so the first, uh, the first steampunk novel was uh, called The Difference Engine, based on uh, Charles Babbage's work. You know, science fiction, but that takes place in the 1800s. Maybe y'all know what steampunk is, maybe you don't. Okay, so onward and upward. Back to our PowerPoint. The idea is, is that we will be giving our computer a series of instructions to do. Computer systems, hardware and software. What is hardware? Hardware is the stuff you can pick up. This is hardware. What is software? It's the stuff you can't pick up stuff that you download, you know, off the app store or whatever. The hardware is the stuff that, the mechanisms of the computer, the central processing unit, the main memory, the secondary memory, the storage. So what is main memory? That, that people measure, that's the RAM of the computer. People talk about RAM, which stands for random access memory. Nowadays, if you buy a phone, it's probably got like two gigabytes or one gigabyte of RAM built in. If you buy a laptop, it's probably got eight gigabytes of RAM built in. And these, these are just astronomical numbers compared to what you, you could get, you know, a decade or two decades ago. And then there's secondary memory. That is the ability to save something. You know, RAM, once you turn your computer off, it loses what's in, what's in its memory, which is why your computer has to reboot each time the power is interrupted. But with secondary memory, that's the hard drive. That's a, where you get your stuff saved, and then later you can load it back in. Now, nowadays, people are getting away from the idea of hard drives. You know, our phones and our tablets don't have hard drives, but they do have flash RAM devices, which act in a way that the hard drives of old, old days did. And they work more quickly because there are no spinning parts in them, unlike the hard drives that are installed in these computers. Then input devices. Input is when you're typing stuff into the computer, and then output devices. Output is when stuff is being displayed. And on a modern device, those things are blurred. You know, this screen here is both my input and my output device. But as far as this C++ class, our input device is going to be typing things in on a keyboard, and our output device is going to be a console window, a console window being something like that. really curious, you can read the rest of the chapter about what is a CPU, what is main memory, that kind of stuff. What is storage? Okay, so main memory is a series of places that numbers can be written to or read from. If your computer has eight gigabytes of RAM, it can hold eight billion different numbers. The gigabytes if the prefix giga means billion, and byte means 8-bit number. Well, what is bits? What are, what, what are these words you're throwing at me? Okay, so let's talk about what a bit is. The most fundamental thing that a computer can store is either a zero or a one. Whether something is on or it's off.
So like if you have a light bulb, on or off. If you have, you know, a piece of aluminum and you have a hole punch in it, you can punch in, you know, places where it's on, and then if you leave it unpunched, it's off. That's actually the way a, a, a CD works, is it's an aluminum substrate with holes burned into it by a laser beam. Can you see anything? Where's the rest of my screen? Okay, so ultimately data is encoded as all zeros and ones, and that's called binary. So there's a joke. Nah, I'm going to skip the joke for now. Anyways, um, so a place that can hold either a zero or a one is known as a bit. If you have a four-bit number, it's four places that can hold zeros or ones. So you could have zero, 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 zero. You could have zero, 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 one. You can have zero, zero, one, zero, and so on. Um, there's actually 16 different combinations, and I'm not going to write them all out right now. The different combinations of the zeros and the ones represent different numeric different numeric values. I'm going to go ahead and do a few more. What I am doing is I'm pretending that I uh, this is an odometer like in your car, but we only have zeros and ones, so we can't count all the way up to 9. All we can do is count to 1 before the odometer rolls over. So what's the next number after 0000? zero, 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 zero? We've driven a mile. Now our odometer reads that. We drive another mile. And just like if this was a 9 on the odometer in our car, what happens? When you hit 9 and then you go another mile, it resets that one back to 0 and then it pushes a 1 over into the next call. The same thing happens here. This 1 resets back to being a 0 and a 1 gets pushed over to the next call. Then we can drive another mile. So we add a 1 onto our odometer. Now this is like if our odometer hit 99. You're going to drive one more mile, and 99 is going to turn into 100. So again, this number here gets reset to a 0 and a 1 carried to the next place. And this number gets reset to a 0 and a 1 here added to the next place. And then if we were going to count these out, that's a 0 in base 10. 10 because we have 10 digits on our fingers. That's a 1. That's a 2. That's a 3. That's a 4. And if we kept going, we could count all the way up to 15. That's a 5. Now, what's the next number in this sequence? After I drive another mile, what's our odometer going to say? Zero, zero, one, one, zero. Yep, zero, 0110. One, zero. Then it's going to say zero, 0111. Then it's like that magic moment when you had 99,000 miles on your car and it rolled over 100,000. We were all excited. Well, I, I was a nerd. But anyways, there we go. And then the same sequence. So hopefully I did this right. There should be 16 different possibilities counting that... Uh, Zero is one of them. That's a five, that's a six, that's a seven, that's an eight, that's a nine, or ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Now a byte, megabytes, gigabytes, all that is eight bits. So instead of just being one 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 or oh 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 oh, it's actually got room for eight, three four five six seven eight, all the way up to the largest value is one 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 one, and for reasons I'm not going to explain right now, that is equal to the decimal, the base ten value of two hundred fifty five. So a byte is the smallest unit of information that the computer can address in memory.
and it will contain a value anywhere between 0 and 255 in it. And your Nintendo was an 8-bit computer. Your Nintendo, the values in it, your would go up to a maximum of 255. You might have 255 different shades for the programmer to be able to choose from to put on the screen or whatever. And then the Super Nintendo and the Genesis came out and they were 16-bit devices. So they weren't only limited to 8-bit numbers, they, were, they, they could hold numbers that were twice as wide, which greatly expanded the resolution of the screen and how many colors could be displayed on them. If you have 16 bits, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That's equal to 65535. So the genesis of the uh, Super Nintendo could display a lot more colors on the screen. Then you had your PlayStations come out, and they just had an incredible architecture, 64 bits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I, I can't tell you how many colors that was, but you know, obviously the resolution was greatly enlarged, the colors that could be displayed on a single screen were greatly enlarged or whatever. So when, they, when, when you used to hear, you know, how many bits is this computer or whatever, that's what it meant, is the math that the chip could process would, would group the bytes together in, in order to support, you know, how much memory the thing could address how many colors could be displayed by the graphics chip, and so on. So, whenever I talk about memory in this class, though, I'm just going to be talking about bytes. And your computer has billions of them available to it. And you can think of them as like being a billion different mailboxes, all lined up in a row, each one containing one number. So each byte in memory is identified by a unique number known as the address, just like the mailboxes. So if you could open up your computer and look at the first 30 spots on it, you might see some numbers. It has 30 different places. Now this doesn't have all the numbers filled in, but it's got a few numbers filled in. The number 149 is filled in there. And then the number 72 is filled in here. Notice again that these numbers are less than or equal to 255, which I said was the largest value that a byte could contain. So we're saying that 149 is stored at memory address 16, and 72 is stored at memory address 23. Notice it started counting at 0 rather than 1. That's why my homework assignments start at 0, homework assignment 0, just to get us on the idea that we count starting with 0 rather than 1 when we're dealing with computers. Because zero actually counts. Yeah, it's a quantity that you have to count. And uh, if you have a list of items, if uh, you say that uh, I'm going to go to the store and buy some bread, milk, and soda, this is stored in memory as some form of list starting at a certain memory address. Let's say that this is at memory address 10,000. Then let's say that this is at 10,001. And this is at memory address 2002. And I've already goofed in this explanation, but you can see that the first item is considered at element 10,000 plus zero. So that is list element zero, or memory address zero. And then this is memory address one, because it's at 10,000, it's at 1,000 plus one and this is at 1,000 plus 2. So this is called zero-based indexing, where the first element in anything is always element number zero. So back in this uh, page here, this is index element number zero. If we had a list, we would have a certain address here, and then that address plus zero would contain that value and that address plus one would contain the next value, and that address plus two would contain that value. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, so we, we will always start counting at zero whenever we're talking about lists, or the, another word is arrays, anytime we have a sequence of values. The first one is position zero, the second one is position one, and so on.
So programs and programming languages. What is a program? It's a set of instructions that the computer follows to perform a task. Well, there are other forms of sets of instructions. There are recipes. So we're going to make a recipe for a cake. One, get pan. Two, stir ingredients. Three, add two pounds flour. Four, bake for 45 minutes. Five, add two cups sugar. Six, eat. Now this is the world's stupidest recipe. The instructions are out of order. But it is a recipe. It's a program. It's a program that I am supposed to follow. So a program is just a recipe. It's a series of steps. But this is a stupid one. It won't work. At least it's all in English, though. What if the uh, recipe looked like this? What if step six was add there? You know, that isn't even English. We don't even understand what that means. If I was trying to follow the recipe, I wouldn't be able to do that at all. That's what's known as a syntax error. A syntax error is when the instruction doesn't make any sense. For whatever reason, computers are really picky. You leave off a semicolon, that's a syntax error. You capitalize something and it didn't expect it to be capitalized, that's a syntax error. You know, humans understand things a lot better. Um, we can fill in the blanks. So if this just said two teaspoons salt like that, that's not a whole sentence. It doesn't say add two and TSP is an abbreviation, you know, or whatever, but we can figure all that out. But if, if we were telling a computer what to do, these steps would have to be very exact. So having that garbage there was an example of a syntax error. It would have to be corrected before the recipe could be interpreted, before it could be understood. Once we did it, once we fixed it, if we rewrite it so that that line is no longer messed up, you know, add three teaspoon of salt. There's no syntax errors anymore, but it's still a very broken recipe. You probably aren't supposed to stir the ingredients before you've added them. You're probably not supposed to bake it before you add the sugar. That kind of thing. The ratios are totally wrong. But you get the idea. Um, now that it's got no syntax errors, but it still won't produce the results we want, that's what's known as a logical error. Or some texts call it a semantic error. So when we're doing our programming, as you type stuff in, you're going to be making typos. Those are syntax errors. Once your program compiles and actually runs and starts displaying stuff on the screen, if it doesn't behave correctly, that's a logic error. That's a semantic error. So in terms of deciding what we want to do, we come up with an algorithm, a set of well-defined steps. Here's an algorithm. Let's see if I can get rid of this. For displaying pay. Display a message on the screen asking how many hours did you work. Wait for the user to enter the number of hours worked. Once the enter, user enters the number stored in memory. Display a message on screen. How much do you get paid per hour? Wait for the user to enter an hourly pay rate. Once they do, store it in memory. Then multiply the number of hours by the amount paid per hour and store the result in memory. Then display a message on the screen that tells the amount of money earned. The message should include the result of the calculation performed in step five. Now this algorithm doesn't allow you to earn any overtime. When I give you this assignment, I will ask you to include overtime or whatever. So this is a description. It's a very vague and wordy version of programming. You could not type this stuff into a program and have it work, but it is an algorithm. The algorithm is the English description of the program. It's also known as pseudocode. 
But pseudocode is a little bit more specific than that. When you use pseudocode, you make it look kind of like a programming language, but not really. It's no programming language in particular. And then you give it to a programmer, and they can turn it into Python or Java or C++. So to re rewrite this into something that's a little less wordy, we're going to do this. Display how many hours did you work? Input H. Display. How much do you get paid per hour? And instead of calling that H, I'm going to call that hours. And then so input rate. Then we're going to calculate. Calculate pay equals hours times rate. Display you earned. this much and then display the pay something like that this is pseudocode pseudo meaning kind of it's not a programming language it's just English but it's it's a lot closer to a programming language than this is we could turn that into a program pretty easily let's go ahead and do that we're gonna open up Visual Studio if you don't have an icon for it just go to the start box type in VIS Studio 2013. Do File New Project. The type of project we want is an empty project. And we're going to call this one Pay1, one, P-A-Y-1, one, because it's our first payroll program. We're going to write better ones in the future, likely. Then I click OK. Off here on the side where it says source files, we're going to right click and do add new item. And we can just leave the name of the item source.cpp. So we're going to click add. I'm going to write here is going to be actual programming code version of the pseudocode that I just created over here. So up at the top, we will always have at least one include and perhaps more than one, which brings in a library of code. Pound sign, hashtag, I call it pound sign because I'm old, pound sign, include, angle brace, the less than sign, the shift comma, IO stream. Then I'm going to add another line that says using namespace std. Now none of this stuff appeared in that pseudocode. That's kind of the difference between writing a program and writing pseudocode. Pseudocode is when you're hammering out the logic, but then the programmer is supposed to turn that logic into actual code. And so a lot of this stuff we're going to wind up typing in over and over and over. So I'm actually just going to save it on my machine and call it boilerplate so that I can bring it back in anytime I want. 
Now in the next line, <clears throat> I'm going to do INT main, parentheses in parentheses, and uh, I know that we did something like this on Wednesday, so this is going to look familiar. And on the next line, I want a curly brace, which is the shift of the square brace next to the P key. Now I can actually do this stuff. Display how many hours did you work. Okay. C out, arrow, arrow, and then inside quotes, double quotes, how many hours did you work. That took care of the display. Now we're going to input the hours. We don't have a variable yet to store hours, so I would need to declare the hours. I'm going to call it a double because that's a floating point type. That way they can type in 3.5 or you know anything with a decimal point. So double hours. And then hours, excuse me, and then CIN, arrow, arrow, into hours, except this time the, uh, the greater than signs point to the variable. Greater than signs, less, rather than less than signs. Now, I like to organize things a little bit. It's not strictly necessary, but I would rather see my variables declared up at the top. So although pseudocode doesn't have any concept of declaring your variables, in a language like C++ or Java, you do have to declare them before you can use them. So you see that line that says double hours? I'm just going to cut that. I'm going to highlight it all, hit Control x for cut. And I'm going to paste it above that C out line. And I'm going to add another variable to it. Double rate. And then one more. Double pay. So now I have three variable declarations. These are variables that are going to hold the Two of them are going to hold in pieces of data that the user types in, and then this last one, pay, is going to hold the data that is a result of the calculation. Okay, so we did this step. How many hours did you work? Input hours. Now we need to display the next message. How much do you get paid per hour? C out. How much do you earn per hour? followed by a semicolon after the quote. I'm going to take a couple spaces out, blank lines out from the top. Now we need to let them type that in, so we're going to use the CIN. CIN into the variable called rate. That has to match that. If I type this in with a lowercase r there, then I better not make that an uppercase r there. The next thing in the pseudocode was to do this calculation. Pay is equal to hours times rate. So I'm going to tack that on. Pay is equal to hours times rate. Then we're going to want to display our results. So as you've already noticed, C out puts information on the screen while C in lets them type it in. After we've calculated it, we're not going to use C I in anymore, but we are going to use C I out, C out to display this. C out, you earned So here it gets kind of tricky. That's an end quote, so this is all one string. And then I had two more arrows, two more less than signs. And then a variable name followed by two more less than signs, followed by another string. Now I'm going to run it, so I go into the Build menu and choose Build Solution. 
can't see what the result is, so I'm going to pop this up and hopefully it'll show me. It says build succeeded. Now I should be able to run it by clicking on the green arrow up here, local Windows debugger. And then it pops open a window. Okay. How many hours did you work? I work 40 hours a week. How much do you earn per hour? 12.5. And it closed it. I forgot to put in the little command that would leave the window open after it displayed everything. So I'm going to add that system pause command that we did on our last program too. So the last line is going to be system with a lowercase s, system. And then inside the parentheses is going to be the word pause surrounded by double quotes. So as we look at it, there are things that we could do to make this look better. Maybe we want the data that they type in to be on the next line, or at least a space after the question mark. After it says you have earned $500, it sure would be nice if it went to the next line before it did press any key to continue. There are two ways that you can cause your output to go to the next line. One is with backslash in, and the other is with the keyword E and DL. And so I'll show you each one of them in turn. I'm going to go back up to this message that says how many hours did you work? And before the quote, but after the question mark, I'm going to put a backslash, which is the key that's above the enter, not next to the question mark. Backslash end for new line. I could do the same thing here, but I'm going to show you the other way of doing it, which is to use the ENDL keyword. So here, after the quote, but before the semicolon, I'm going to put arrow, arrow, ENDL. So those are the things that I added. I just added that, and I added that. I like slash in, actually. So usually I'm going to use it unless, well, I'll, I'll tell you the circumstances when I... I'd use the other one otherwise. So I'm going to tack on a slash in here after the word dollars. You have to close your currently running window before it'll let you build and run the next one, usually. So I'm going to close that window and then build and run it again. Build solution. It says build succeeded. Run it. How many hours did I work? I worked 100 hours. How much do you earn per hour? Two, you earn $200. Okay. So this is called a line feed, slash end. Slash end stands for new line. This is what's known as an escape sequence. We don't talk much about escape sequences in C, so I'm not going to dwell on that term. Okay, so we've written our first program. This is a recipe for figuring out somebody's pay rate based on some information. We read a general description, we turned it into pseudocode, and then we turned it into programming code. If we were going to do this in Java or Python or whatever, the details would be very different, or at least somewhat different. Java and C++ look a lot alike but you won't see this arrow arrow business in any other programming language that uh, that I'm aware of. So breaking this apart, and I'll pause the recording and wander around and make sure everybody got this. All of our programs are going to have this line pretty much. Pound sign include IOStream. This brings in the library that gives us the ability to use C out and C in. IO, input, output. These are what are known as streams. This is a output stream. It displays stuff on the screen. Cout stands for console output stream. 
CIN stands for console input stream. It lets us type stuff in from the keyboard. If I did not have this line here, include IO stream, the rest of the program would not work. So that was mandatory. Now it's underlining C out and C in because I deleted that. I'm going to undo that. This next line is optional. And a lot of programmers do not like to have that line of code in there. It's totally fine to take it out, but it has a consequence. I'm going to delete this line that says using namespace. No, I'm not. I may want to put it back in. I'm going to at least comment it out by putting the two slashes in front of it. But then I have to make some other changes to get it going. You see where, now that I've commented that, it's, it's underlining as an error every occurrence of the word C out in CIN. So to fix that, I would have to type in STD colon colon in front of the C out and STD colon colon in front of the CN and STD colon colon in front of the C out and over here where I had an E and DL I'd have to put an STD colon colon in front of that so what this line does this using namespace line does is when we brought these functions in the C out and the CIN functions in from this library they came prefaced was known as a namespace. STD is the namespace that they were all located into. This let us skip having typing that every single time. It said, okay, if you type something in and I don't recognize it, just go and, and, and assume that it's part of that namespace. So by leaving this out, I then had to go and put STD colon colon in front of all of these keywords, CIOP, CIN, and ENDL. When you Google up code on the internet, Quite often they will not have this line in there, and you will see std colon colon instead. And that's considered a more professional way of doing it. However, for ease of typing in code up here, I usually will go ahead and put in the using namespace std. Make yourself a little boilerplate file consisting of all of this code. Just select everything. If you know how to select everything, it's control A, like control all. Even if you don't have this program working. Select all of your code, and then open Notepad. Just go to your Start menu, and type in Notepad, and paste it. And we're going to delete everything except, there we go. That's our boilerplate right there. I'm going to be using this over and over and over, and so I'm just going to save it to my desktop or something so that I can get it back and save myself some typing each time we, we do this kind of thing in class. And I'm going to call it boilerplate.txt, and I'm going to save it to the desktop. If we used a different word like INT, that means whole numbers only. So if I replace those words double with INT, that stands for integer. Broadly speaking, we have two categories of numeric data. Integer, which stands for whole numbers, and then floating point, which are numbers which have decimals. If I had made these ints, then these would uh, not support typing in things like 12.5 as the uh, hourly rate. Now, in Java, the default data type for floating point is double, and I'm in the habit of typing double up there as the data type for numbers that need to support decimals. However, in C++, I could just as easily have typed float. Float stands for floating point. I may use one, and I may use the other just based upon which I... Uh, which brain cell fired at that moment. I wish that I had typed float for y'all. Float sounding like floating point. Double doesn't sound nearly as, sens as sensible as the word float. So, I will make a mental note to myself of typing in float as a variable type when I need to support floating point numbers rather than double. The difference between a double and a float is that a double 
at least in some languages, has more bits available to it, so it can hold a much more precise number. What happens if we change these to I and T? And then we run it. If I enter whole numbers, it'll work fine. I work 10 hours a week, I earn 10 an hour, it tells me I worked 100. I'm going to run it again. I'm going to say that I worked 10.2 hours at a pay rate of, now it's already all goofed up. Just didn't work. So when you're allowing somebody to type in numeric input, you may as well make it a floating point type if you have any inkling that they're going to want to be able to type decimal points. You know. You never know. Um, you ask somebody how much they weigh, they'll probably tell you they weigh 120, or but you may even find that one person who wants to say 121.3. So you just have to, I tend to default towards using ints for counters. You know, we have one of this, we have two of that, we have three of that, we have four of that. But if it's a measurement, like somebody's weight or height or, or money, you, know, you make it a float. Yes, sir. Right. They, I, I made this program too wordy. I did not need to do it the way that I did. Here's a better way to do it. Float hours, comma, rate, comma, pay. Like that. Just one line. Why is that better? Well, we're saying that we have one data type and then we have three variables of that type. It just saves some space on the screen. You can't mix and match. If one of these needed to be an integer and the other two needed to be floats, then we'd have to put the integer on its own line. So very good question. That I, I, I consider this an improvement. If yeah, I'll, I'll just say I like that better. And that's how I should have uh, that's how I should have had you type it. So although these, this is the algorithm, it defines the steps, it's not ready to be executed on the computer. The computer only executes machine language instructions. Is this machine language what we're looking at here? Not there. Here. And no, that is a programming language. It's not machine language. <coughs> Let's see if we can get an example of machine language. Well, there we go. Zeros and ones. Or, here we go. Obviously, we're not going to be able to generate anything that looks like that. What's happening is that the chip inside your computer, the processor, is actually just programmed using numeric codes, known as opcodes. And if it gets one specific number, it, it, mean, it tells it, okay, go to this, this address and load this number in. And if it gets another number, it says, okay, go to this address and write this number out. It's very specific like that. And so computer machine code is just a series of numbers, a series of bits. When we write a program like this, it goes through several steps before it turns in to machine code that can be turned into and that can run that processor inside our computer. There's something called a compiler. When I come up here and I choose build, build solution, it compiles this CPP file. And it makes what's known as object code. Object code looks very similar to that stuff that I was showing you on the screen a minute ago. It, it, it's a form of machine language, but it's not ready to go yet. Then, along with that compilation step, something called a linker comes. And the linker ties all the OBJ files together. If we had more than one CPP file, we would have more than, more than one object file to go with it. It stitches them all together in an executable, the .exe file, if you're using a Windows PC and your application's in the .exe. That is the thing that actually has got the, uh, the machine language in it. So we're not writing machine language, but we're writing programming code which gets converted into machine language and saved 
as an executable file. So machine language, they're binary numbers. But rather than writing programs using machine language, we use programming languages. So there are two kinds of languages, supposedly. There's low level, used for communication with the computer hardware directly. It's often written in zeros and ones. And then there's high level, closer to human language. But there's also an intermediate level. which we will call assembly. <clears throat> Here is an example of Hello World written in assembly for Linux. And there are different kinds of assembly, but if you look at it, it doesn't look like our program at all. If we wanted to write Hello World, all it would have is the line int space, or, you know, include IO stream and then int main, and then that C out arrow arrow, and then the message Hello World, and then maybe a pause command at the end. This is what it looks like in assembler. What assembler is, what assembly is, is these correspond to those opcodes, those numeric codes I told you, told you was uh, controlling your processor. So in order to get your machine to display a message in a window, we need to load into one place on that chip the length of the message. We need to load into the next place on the chip the address of that message, and the message is actually stored down here. And then we do a couple of more things, and then we call an interrupt. And the interrupt at 80, the opcode 80, tells it to display whatever's at this address and this address to the screen. So this converts into those zeros and ones incredibly quickly. You can run something called an assembler on that, and it takes this kind of stuff, this, this really low-level language. It, it's, it doesn't even look like English, but we can see kind of abbreviations, move, int, message, Lint, you know, things like that kind of look like English. Being able to program like this was a huge advancement over just zeros and ones or pure numbers, but we don't want to do that. This is an example of a low level language. High level languages are things more like, um, let's look at hello world in C. I'll tell you what, hello world in many languages. Here it is in C++. I'm not liking the fact that that's broken, so I'm going to go and find a different one. Okay, there's so many different programming languages that have been made. Here's one called Ada. You had to declare a procedure. That's like our, our word int main. And then you had a begin, and then you had a put, and then you had an end. And it would display hello world, except this one said hello ward for some reason. Let's go find C or C. Here's the old language. I guess I'm not going to be able to. C++. You've seen this. We put our pound sign include up at the top, and then we have int main, and then we have std colon colon c out. That's another way. Let's look at Java. Looks a little bit different some other keywords, other boilerplate, but then the print word, instead of being those error arrows, is a function call, system.out.printline. The concepts are all very, very similar across all these programming languages. So once you learn one programming language, and then you learn a second one, by the time you've done those two things,
then you can do any programming language. That's an exaggeration, but it's like once you learn how to speak in both English and, and French, then any of the Romance languages, the related languages, you could learn. You could learn Spanish. You know, you, you learn the syntax of one. That's a gross exa um, exaggeration of the... <coughs> But uh, once, once you learn a couple of programming languages, the syntax of the concepts are the same, even if the way they are expressed is different. Then why are there so many different programming languages? Well, each one is an effort to solve a problem in a slightly different way. So they all are geared to do slightly different things. I think this is about enough lecture. We're going to stop here. Let's go ahead and upload our uh, our pay program I'll make a Dropbox for it won't have any homework yet but I'll uh, make a homework assignment for uh, our that we will assign Wednesday we're going to need you to install Visual Studio or another C++ development tool so that's actually going to be homework zero so I'm gonna make two Dropboxes but the first one I'll make is just our in-class assignment this is in class B, and it's the pay one program. So refresh your Dropbox, you'll see the in class B assignment. We also need a folder homework zero. Install Visual Studio or I'm leaving it up to you if you go and get another C++ development environment for Linux or for Mac or whatever. I will put some more specific instructions in that homework zero. It's not going to be due for a while. For this one, I just need the CPP file. That is correct. So I really want you all to have installed Visual C++ or your C compiler of choice by midnight of Sunday, a week and a half from now. That's a lot of time to download and get it running. Don't wait until the last minute to get it working. And like I said, I'll come up with, uh, with some guidelines for doing so and post it to that folder. That, that's your homework that you ought to be thinking about, and then we'll actually have a homework assignment given on Wednesday. <laughs> So, yeah, in class, just give me the .cpp file, and let's see, yeah. Uh...